Welcome to Railway Legends, Myths, and Stories. I'm Kevin Stanley. In this episode, I will talk about the first steam railways. As we are looking back to the beginning of the 19th century, there were many wagonways, tramways, and plateways in operation. But the question is, who first had steam? For this video, I will be looking at some of the early railways with steam-powered locomotives. This is the time of transition from human and animal haulage to the world of steam. So let's go looking for steam. When talking of the first steam railroad, the answer most often given is the Stockton and Darlington Railway. This line's construction began in 1821 and was designed by George Stevenson. But hold on. That's the kind of myth that series like this are trying to overcome. Most documentaries breeze by so many of the other early engineers, it is time someone gave them their well-deserved credit. So let's look back to the years before 1821. The name Matthew Murray seems to be missing from many a history of the railways and, of course, steam. From 1811 to 1812, Murray, while working at the Middleton Railway, created a number of steam locomotives. Murray, working with Fenton and Wood, built locomotives that were known for their high standards of construction and precision. The one thing a steam engine designer needed was a method of going from the back and forth motion of the piston to the rotary motion needed for a locomotive. What Murray came up with was a fixed ring with internal teeth and a small gear on the piston shaft. While the system was ingenious, a crank and flywheel would have been far simpler. However, James Picard held the patent on the crank and flywheel at this time. As we will see, sometimes it was worth paying patent royalties and sometimes not, so one had to find a way to design around them. By the way, once James Picard's patent expired, Murray switched to the crank and flywheel system. Murray designed several kinds of engines. While he did pay royalties to Richard Trevithick for the use of the high-pressure steam system, Murray also improved on this by the use of twin cylinders. One difference of Murray's locomotive design was that he did not make use of the exhaust to improve the draft as Trevithick had. Being different is not always good. While Murray's system worked, his kind of steam exhaust had the drawback that it produced an awful din. While Murray designed these locomotives, he also used John Blinkensop's patented rack system for propulsion. John Blinkensop had patented a rack rail system in 1811. When patent royalties were reasonable, many would be happy to pay to get the use of what they thought was best. This made for one noted difference of the Middleton Railway. Their locomotives used the rack system. There were clear advantages to rack systems. One of the early Murray Blenkinsop locomotives, weighing only about five tons, was often able to pull a load of 90 tons. The economy of this was obvious. Lighter locomotives meant less need to have heavier and more expensive track. We hope at another time to come back and look much deeper into the work of Matthew Murray. In this early time of the railways, there was a great deal of controversy over the merits of adhesion versus some other system. Adhesion, in this case, means the locomotive's wheels apply their pulling force directly to the track. The locomotive's weight is directly related to how much adhesion the engine has on the track. Of course, heavier locomotives mean you need heavier track and thus more expense. While George Stevenson's initial fame, it seems, comes from the Stockton and Darlington, this was not his first taste of steam. Let's look to Westmore Killingworth in England, where many years earlier George had married and lived at Dial Cottage. By the way, this is where Robert Stevenson made his first appearance, as he was born there in 1803. We will be hearing more about this fellow later. George had many jobs, but he was most often working at the mine pits, controlling the winding gear of the lifts there. 
He paid to study at night, and he understood the value of education. One other part-time job he did was to mend clocks. The engineering spirit glowed bright in George Stevenson. In 1811, George made a name for himself by not only repairing the pumping engine at the high pit, but also by improving it. This success earned him the position of engine right for the collieries at Killingworth. While at Killingworth, George worked on many other inventions. We hope to have a time to look into these in a future video. For the most part, George worked by trial and error, but his keen mind worked out many problems that seemed beyond his education. One drawback that dogged George was his broad Northumberland accent. This form of speech was not thought to be of a learned man. He wanted his son to not be limited by his accent, so he made sure that Robert would be taught to speak in the most standard English of the time. The best information we have indicates that from 1814 to 1825, George Stevenson worked on building some 16 locomotives. Let's look at some of them. In 1814, George Stevenson designed his first locomotive for Killingworth. He based his design on what he had learned seeing a locomotive called Willington, demonstrated at the Kenton and Cox Lodge Colliery and designed by Matthew Murray. Stevenson dispensed with the Murray Blinkensop rack system and re relied on just the adhesion of the locomotive's wheels. Current information gives the name of this locomotive as Blucher. Stevenson, like Trevithick, used the steam exhaust to improve the draft. This greatly enhanced steam output and productivity. It appears that Blucher was first run on the 25th of July, 1814. Although Stevenson later recounted that they called this locomotive My Lord as it was financed by Lord Ravensworth, it seems it was known at the time as Blucher. Some recent scholarship holds that Stevenson's My Lord of 1814 predated Blucher, but it is far from definitive. All the references we currently have do not give enough information on this. We have ordered some more documentation and hope to shed some more light on this in the future. The problem is that Blucher was far from the only locomotive at Killingworth. Stevenson designed many locomotives for operation at Killingworth and for other operations. Often these early locomotives were rebuilt many times or parts for one were used on another. Built in 1816, Stevenson's Billy is now in the Stevenson Museum where it is billed as the world's third oldest existing steam locomotive. One big drawback of these new steam engines was that they were very heavy. The existing tram roads were of light wooden or light iron construction. What early iron plateways there were suffered under the pounding of steam. While we are looking around for early steam, we can see that George Stevenson was a very busy fellow. Now let's look to the Hetton Railway. In 1820, Stevenson was hired to build the 13-kilometer-long Hetton Colliery Railway. He used a combination of gravity on downward inclines and locomotives for level and upward stretches. The gauge was 1,422 millimeters, which Stevenson had known before at the Killingworth Wagonway. There is information that indicates George Stevenson built many other locomotives in the early years before 1821. We have had a hard time chasing down the information about these early locomotives, but it does show that a lot of locomotive building was happening. Let's keep looking around. I think we might find other earlier lines. In 1813, we go to the Willem Colliery near Newcastle. This colliery already had a wooden railway, but now it was time for steam. From 1814 to 1816, William Headley had Christopher Blackett build a number of locomotives, commonly called Puffing Billy, Willem Dilly, and the almost forgotten Lady Mary. As originally built, these engines were in the range of seven tons using four wheels. Like Trevithick's steam locomotive at Pendarin, these locomotives had flangeless wheels for running on flanged track. In 1813, Puffing Billy pulled coal wagons around the colliery, except when it was derailed, which was far more often than was pleasant. 
If you look at this very early locomotive at today, as it is now at London Science Museum, you will see a locomotive that has been rebuilt many times and now sits on flanged wheels. This locomotive is noted for how well liked it is by the Science Museum's cats, as the engine's return flue and chimney makes the interior so inaccessible that it has been their favorite place to have their kittens. Back to the Middleton Railway. The Middleton was originally a wooden wagonway. It was the first railway to come about by an act of Parliament in 1758. The railway ran from the Middleton coal pits to Leeds. Yes, yes, this operation did not start with steam. It used horses to pull wagons on wooden rails. Later, the rails were upgraded by the addition of iron edging. Just to keep track, this system was built at a gauge of 1,245 millimeters. While engineers like Trevithick and Stevenson used adhesion, many thought it would not be of any use if there was any kind of grade. At this time, there were limits of adhesion, especially for light locomotives. Later, I hope to come back to the whole question of adhesion in a future video. There were designers that felt that relying only upon adhesion was not the route to follow. As I mentioned earlier, there was the rack system, but in these early years, a number of other approaches were tried. Let's look at one that might seem a tad silly, but the truly amazing thing is, is that not only is it not silly, but it actually worked. William Brunton's mechanical traveler was, while strange to our eyes, a well thought idea for its time and circumstances. In 1813 in Derbyshire, William Brunton came up with the idea for a mechanical traveler. It was constructed by the Butterley Company. The use of mechanical legs to push itself forward was more than a novel idea. Some might say it was inspired. One major factor was that at the Butterley Company's track, they had to contend with a gradient of 1 in 50 on the 2 kilometer line from the limestone quarry to the Cromford Canal. As hard as it may be for us to believe this was not just a one-off try. In 1814, the Mechanical Traveler II was tried, and in 1815, something similar was also tried. On the 31st of July, 1815, at the New Bottle Colliery in County Durham, a new and larger Mechanical Traveler was demonstrated. A large number of spectators were on hand to view this new mechanical marvel. Sadly, the wrought iron boiler had had its safety valves tightened far too much. The boiler exploded, killing 13 people. This was one of the first major railway disasters, and in the wake of this catastrophe, interest in the mechanical traveler faded away. In many years of reading, I had only seen one sketch of the mechanical traveler and thought of it as an idea that would never have really worked. To my surprise, Adrian Dyer built a model of this design, and the model works. We'll put a link in the description to the full video showing this wonderful model of this long-lost idea. Seeing this model run has really changed my mind, and I must take my hat off to this engineering marvel. Thank you, Adrian Dyer, for your letting us all have a look back and giving us some idea of the wizardry of William Brunton. Let's look to one of the other methods of getting around the problem of adhesion. In 1812, the brothers William and Edward Chapman designed a rail locomotive that was propelled by pulling itself along a chain that ran between the running rails. The idea made some sense, but was never much of su any success. Later, they worked out a new design in an eight-wheel machine. One unique feature was that the locomotive had an early form of trucks, or bogies. These bokies had a bit of swivel, helping to keep the engine on the tracks. They also distributed the load, thus reducing the strain on the light track. This locomotive managed to haul 54-ton loads without the use of a center chain. So, is there a clear-cut answer to the question, where was the first steam railway? Well, I'm not really sure. There were many people experimenting and building, and so the answer is going to come down to how you precisely define things. Many of the early steamroads had already been running using draft animals. So while they had tried to make use of steam, they were not exclusively steam. 
Most of these early roads were only transitionally steam. Here at RLMS, for the first use of steam on the rails, we will give the honor to Richard Trevithick. So while never in regular service, the first use of steam traction goes to the tram road from Pinadaran to Abercannon on the 21st of February, 1804. Please look at our video, The Coming of Steam, and see the link in the description. The test runs of the very early Trevithick steam engines were a start, and while not in regular service, this did show the way. One other thing that is little mentioned is that Richard Trevithick built more than one early locomotive, but the information on others than the Pindaran and the Catch Me Who Can is sparse. However, we can say with some certainty that the Stockton and Darlington definitely did use steam, but it was not the first railway to use steam-powered locomotives to pull cars and wagons along rails or other fixed guideways. It does appear, however, that the Stockton and Darlington probably had the best press agent. I would not be at all surprised to find out there are others who operated steam locomotives in these early years. If we can find them, we will be sure to try and bring more of them to you. And as always, we'll see you on the train.